All right, success um, on our Facebook Live simulcast. Nice. All right. Bunker one, technology zero. If you're keeping score at home. <laughs> That's right. All right. All right, folks, we will, uh, we will get started here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, today, we are going to pick up our conversation where we left off before about the PPP, uh, the part of the, the CARES Act, the stimulus package that was designed to help small businesses. Uh, there was one round of it that came through and uh, the money went very quickly and now the second round is, has come out and so there's still some questions around that and uh, so we wanted to get everyone back together again and just kind of go over what this means and what it looks like. Uh, we have Ryan Ganaw from uh, the Military Wallet and Kirby Atwell from Bunker Labs uh, joining us today and uh, our wonderful expert facilitator Liz Marion will be kicking us off. Take it away Liz. All right, well, welcome everybody. I know people are still joining and we do have this simulcast on Facebook. Um, you know, if, if you want to share that link as well in our Launch Lab Online, it is a closed Facebook group though, so I encourage people to share the actual attendee link here for the Zoom webinar. Um, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, feel free to use the chat um, to talk amongst yourselves, um, to share links and resources, um, but we will be pulling questions actually from the Q&A box that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we encourage you to use that for, for questions for our guests. Uh, Ryan and Kirby, welcome back for uh, the second round of PPP. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for having us. So Ryan, I want to start with you. Um, so there's a second round now that we're in the midst of for PPP. Can you just give us the lay of the land a little bit um, and talk about what this means? Are there differences and where we go from here? Yeah, so what it means is the first program was uh, oversubscribed. It was a massive success or, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, tons of companies are hurting. A lot of people applied. The funds went uh, gosh, it was a week, a week and a half, and they ran out. So um, Congress pushed through an extension. They added another 300 plus million dollars, uh, sorry, billion dollars to this program. And they're allowing basically the same qualifications for businesses. So anybody who missed out on the first round can apply now. Um, the only big difference is um, some of the bigger companies that are publicly traded and we're receiving you know, millions of dollars from this program. Uh, the treasury came back and told them, you should probably return that. Uh, so they're, they are being a little more strict with some of the major companies that are applying for um, this loan. But other than that, it's, it's the same thing as before, except we have a little more clarification on, on some of the guidelines. And so for those guidelines, you know, we've had a lot of questions in our community and I, I did see that you dropped a link, so I appreciate that. But EIDL versus PPP, Right. So what are the differences and what can people find out which one they should be applying to? Yeah, great question. So the, the EIDL is the, is the Economic Impact Disaster Loan, and it's designed for any company that has been impacted by the coronavirus, uh, you know, the, the whatever you want to call the, the stay at home orders uh, and all these businesses that are closed. The, there are a few differences in terms of um, who can apply. They're kind of similar. I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on the EIDL. Uh, the difference though is the EIDL, can, um, the loan is a 30 year period. The PPP loan is a two year period. The interest rates are different. It's a 1% interest rate on the PPP loan. I think it's uh, 3.75 for businesses or 2.75 for nonprofits on the EIDL. And the EIDL is not forgivable. The PPP loan is forgivable um, up to, you know, if, if you qualify based on that. Um, those are the big differences. Um, I'll put a, a link in here for these uh, that we can share with folks. That would be the best source to go to. Um, and then I would talk to your tax professional if you have one to really find out which one is best for you. You can do both. However, there are some rules about how that works. Uh, again, I'm gonna defer to an expert on that one. Okay, great. But that is a key difference about being forgivable. Kirby, go ahead. Well, one thing I just wanted to add, and I think that's a great uh, explanation, but um, you know, if, you, if we go back to the, the purpose behind this and think about like why, why were these issued to start with? And so the 
the PPP, it stands for Pay Paycheck Protection Program. And so Congress basically said, we realize we just shut down the entire country and we're about to have a massive influx of, of uh, unemployed people applying for unemployment. And so how do we pass out basically a stimulus to these em employees, these people who are working without them having to go through unemployment. And so they said, we're going to do this through employers of small businesses, and we're going to make it readily available and pretty easy to get quickly. Um, and it's, it's hundred percent. I mean, the, the whole purpose of it was to go toward um, pay payroll expenses. And so it passes through the employers and goes directly to the uh, to the um, employees, and they're incentivized to to use it for payroll over the next eight eight weeks because then it's forgiven, um, and so you can use it for a few other expenses too. But the the vast majority, that's the whole point of this, and so that's what the PPP is, and then the, the EIDL um, is designed for any type of expenses. So that's that's not forgiven. It's more of like your traditional type of of loan is just being offered. Um, there's some uh, better terms and, and you can get it quicker and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it doesn't have to go toward payroll. So you can actually get both at the same time. That's great. Thanks, Kirby. And, and I want to go back to you to this next question first, which is, so I kind of want to demystify this a little bit for people about this, you know, bank relationships. We've been talking about this a lot over the past few weeks, specifically in relation to PPP, which is having a relationship with your bank and then, um, you know, entrepreneurs going to uh, their bank and then having to also apply at another bank or just choosing to do so to doing, you know, uh, applying at a local bank. So Kirby, can you talk about that and like establishing those relationships and how this, you know, even though it's during the PP, this is also um, a good time to establish those relationships um, with a bank and how one goes about and does that in order to get, you know, the proper things together um, if something like this happens in the future. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's unfortunately one of the biggest um, complaints or biggest struggles that most of the people in this community who didn't get the PPP that applied for it have had is that there's banks like, you know, some of the, the top ones like Wells Fargo that just, you know, really dropped the ball on it. And there's others that were just, they weren't organized enough because they're such a large institution to get going as quickly as they needed to. And then also a lot of them focused on if they can get, you know, a, a $10 million loan as opposed to a, you know, $50,000 loan it's bigger bang for the buck. So they focus their energy there. So if we look at the numbers though, on the first one, so there's $350 billion loaned out. Uh, they exhausted those funds two weeks ago yesterday. Um, and so that was, you know, about less than two weeks after it opened. 74% um, 74, 74 of those loans were under 150,000. So there were a lot of smaller loans. They just, um, you know, the, the ones that, that, made the press were, you know, the, the Ruth Chris's and the Shake Shacks that uh, got massive loans. Um, and then 80% of those loans were, they came from community banks. So you can see if 80% were from community banks, they were the ones that were agile enough to, um, to issue those loans quickly before the funds ran out. So that's why it's so important to establish those relationships. And there are banks now, especially now with the second round who are taking new customers. Um, somebody, uh, just got a loan through, um, man, I think it was Oklahoma state bank. They just, somebody just reached out and said they, they just got a, uh, a, a loan. that's a, uh, through a, a community bank that they didn't have a relationship with before. They don't even live in Oklahoma. And, um, they, they, uh, were able to establish that relationship now and get the loan right away. So I would definitely focus on the banks where you can actually talk to a banker face to face. Yeah, I think that that's uh, great advice. Um, and it, it leads into my next point of uh, documentation um, and what to bring to these banks. So Ryan, can you speak um, a little bit to just the logistics as a business and the documentation that you need when you're applying for something like this to, you know, to help your chances of success in applying for PPP or EIDL? Yeah, great question. Um, I haven't applied for the EIDL, so I don't have the uh, answer there. And it's probably going to be different for uh, EIDL versus PPP because the P 
PPP, as we said, is paycheck protection. So they want to know what your payroll is because it's designed to replace your payroll and keep your business operating for the next two months. Um, so what I had to do when I applied was I had to provide copies of my payroll ledger. Um, I use a company called Gusto, just gusto.com. They're a very inexpensive, super easy to use um, payroll provider. And they had, they were on top of things. So I just went into my um, dashboard, logged in, and I was able to download some forms that had everything broken out for me. Uh, a lot of the payroll processing firms are doing this right now. Um, I don't remember, I think it's ADP or, or Paychex, a lot of the other ones. I don't know the names of all of them, but uh, check with your payroll provider. If you do your payroll yourself, or if you have a, a local accountant do it, or you use a different payroll provider, see if they have a system or some software that can print that out for you. Uh, mine was just a, a quick PDF. I uploaded that to the bank's website. This was entirely run online. Um, I had to provide articles of incorporation and a few other documents. It was not a lot. Um, in addition to that, I had to provide um, office, officers, uh, name, personal information, social security number, driver's license number, um, and some other information. And uh, just a breakdown of how the business was, uh, who the officers are and all of that. Uh, so it's, it's basic information. It was not a lengthy process other than gathering a few documents. Once that was uploaded, the bank will handle all the backend verification and then you're sent a very quick um, DocuSign that you have to review and sign and uh, it was actually really cool I took a picture of my driver's license and they scanned it and compared that to the information I have on file with some kind of state database or something and they I verified my ID just from a picture of my driver's license and then everything was approved. It was, it's, it's a pretty slick process and it, it wasn't too onerous on the part of, of the uh, small business owner, at least as at a small level. If you have a more complex arrangement, if you have a lot of officers, if you have dozens and dozens of employees and you don't have a, um, a quick payroll journal or something that you can upload, then it's obviously going to take a lot more time. Absolutely. Um, and I just want to add a, a quick housekeeping. I am seeing um, a lot of viewers on our Facebook Live as well. If you, excuse me, if you have questions, um, feel free to post them in the Facebook group, either under the watch party or the live. Um, and Sabrina and Jada, who are watching, if you guys can push those to me in a message, uh, that would be great on our Zoom, um, just so we don't miss anybody as we continue in our conversation. Um, so Kirby, you know, there are certain, uh, you know, like what, how do I qualify? Um, or how do I know if I qualify? Have the, have those qualifications changed for round two? And can we get a refresher on what those qualifications are as Ryan is speaking to employee numbers, um, you know, and what the difference is in complexities? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So, um, the basic gist of it is it's designed for small businesses. So uh, like we talked about, and you could go back and, and look at our round one uh, live in the group as well, but um, we talked a lot more about qualifications in there, but it's basically if you have 500 employees or less, then you qualify. Um, one thing that, that they hadn't clarified previously that, that they have now clarified more around in the frequently asked questions uh, document that the treasury release, which I posted a link to that in the, uh, in the chat section as well. If you want to check it out, it's, it's question 31. And that was uh, around what constitutes need for this loan, because that wasn't something that was, that was um, they were pushing very much. I think the intent initially was like, let's get this out. There's one question on the application. Um, and the question is uh, economic uncertainty caused by COVID requires you to need this loan, basically. Um, and so you have to certify that you, that you do need this loan. And there was, again, a lot of press around these publicly traded companies that have access to, to large capital markets that really it's, it's very difficult for them to certify that. But if, and even for a small business, uh, it applies to them too. If, if this is the, you know, you're just thriving right now in your business because you sell something that's COVID proof, um, then this doesn't apply for you. So I, I'd say that's, that's another thing to look at beyond just being a small business with employees, with a payroll. 
um, you know, you can calculate how much you qualify for. The, the Treasury now has on their, their website um, a, a calculation, uh, a, a, calcul a payroll protection program calculator that you can check out. Um, and that's how, how you know how much you qualify for. But, um, but you, you do have to actually have the need for it in addition to that. Absolutely. Um, and I, I do want to get to some of the questions that we have. Um, but I want to I want to go over two things until we do that, which is so 1099 sole proprietors. Uh, Ryan, what's different for contractors and sole proprietors with the PPP? Yeah, so uh, sole proprietors and contractors can apply for the PPP loan. And uh, I do know several folks who have applied and have been approved. You're going to have to do a little extra legwork on the application side. Uh, one of my friends who is a small business owner had his accountant run through and do some forms. And I don't know the specifics of it because my business is uh, set up with payroll and all that. So for me, it was just payroll journals. Um, I think what they had to do was figure out what his owner draw was. And they base that divided by 12 to get your monthly annualized salary off of that. And that's how they were able to do that. Now, as far as counting contractors and um, freelancers and things like that. So I, as a small business owner, I have several employees. I also have some contractors. I can use the payroll forgiveness toward the salaried folks, but I cannot use it toward contractors, freelancers, 1099, et cetera. Uh, that's because those individuals can apply on their own. So in essence, you would be able to apply and then pay them and then they would do it also. So it'd be kind of double dipping. So it's only for payroll. If your your company operates with payroll, if you are self-employed or a contractor, uh, most of your income is 1099 miscellaneous, then you can apply on your own. The, the only difference, and I'm not sure of that, is, is the exact paperwork and how that's done. Um, that's where I would say reach out to your tax professional. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and, and you know, and in a lot of our um, entrepreneurs, I know that if you're watching, and we talk about this a lot in the Launch Lab Online group, which is um, that they are, you know, right now 1099 or contractors or sole proprietors while they're building their business. So that's really great information. And to Ryan's point, just to reiterate, um, you know, for the specifics, reach out to your tax professional um, to get that information. Um, and so lastly, I just want to talk about before we go to some of these questions is payment timing. So from the time you apply and the clock starts, what does that payment timing uh, look like? Uh, Ryan, do you want to give us some insight on that? Yep, it's, it's eight weeks. Um, so there's two, two timing questions, actually. The first one is once you're approved for your loan, the bank has 10 days to fund it. Most people I've talked to have been funded anywhere between one day and five days. It's usually pretty quick. Some banks are actually fronting the money before they receive it from the Small Business Administration because they know it's coming. So they just give it to the small business owners because they know that they, they need it to keep their operations going. So that's the first one. Once approved, you have 10 days to receive the money. Uh, the second thing is you have eight weeks from the day you receive the money to spend it and have it to be forgiven. So you can, you can keep this as a low interest loan. It's, it's a 1% loan for two years. So you don't have to spend the balance of it within eight weeks. The only thing that the eight weeks applies to is whether or not you can have that amount forgiven. Um, and that to be forgiven, it has to go toward payroll, benefits, uh, rent and utilities, or, or the interest on a mortgage payment. So there are certain um, qualif qualifying uh, expenses that can be forgiven. And for that to happen, it must be spent within eight weeks. Anything that you don't spend with eight, within eight weeks is not forgiven. It just is a 1% interest loan. And then you have up to two years to pay that off. There should not be any prepayment penalties. Uh, however, some loans are being sold in the secondary market. And uh, they say that if you don't, if you with pay, if you prepay uh, more than X percentage, you may have to uh, pay like 21 days worth of interest or something like that. It's not a huge penalty. Just read the documentation on your loan to verify how everything works. Right. And, and just to, just to be clear too, you know, I know we talked to numbers just a little bit, but those numbers of how you, you qualify for it at Kirby's point, you know, now there is a calculator um, on the government website so that you can actually calculate how much. And then if that's not forgiven, you know, obviously add 1% interest to that over the next two years. Um, 
So I wanna ask one of uh, a question that's directed to you, Kirby, uh, for real estate, um, which is the first round saw some media pushback on real estate benefits. Uh, what do real estate investors, uh, loosely defined as anyone who owns one or more rental properties, uh, what do they need to know about PPP? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Um, I, so I have a, a small real estate investing company as well. Um, and the what I've seen is that the PPP is really generally not designed for real estate investors. Um, most real estate investors hire a lot of contractors, have, have pretty minimal employees. And so um, contractors, as Ryan said, can apply for this on their own. So they are... Um, they're, they're not to be included in the calculations for what you qualify for, for the PPP. So, um, so you know, if as an investor, I would look more at the idle, if, if you need it right now, um, I would look more at the, the idle loan as an option. Um, and then also one thing that a lot of people, a lot of investors aren't considering or aren't, haven't really um, heard as much about because it's not covered as much is there's this loss carry back uh, provi provision in the CARES Act. Um, and so what this is allowing to happen just for 2019 filing, which has been extended to July, um, is that you can take losses that, that you incur this year and you can go back five years and start applying those. Um, and, and I'm not an accountant, so I'm, you know, uh, I'm not going to get in the technicalities of it, but you go back five years, you apply it to that year. Once that loss runs out, you apply it to the next year um, and all the way through. And so you can actually get real money this year because the way it worked previously is if you had a loss, you had to carry that forward into the next year and you, know, um, you could apply it to next year's taxes. But this way it allows you to carry it back, amend your returns, and you can get actually money in your pocket this year. And so if you own a commercial building, you could do a cost segregation, and I, I won't get into a lot of details, but basically you can segregate out the components of your building and depreciate a lot of those components right up front this year and get a pretty massive loss on your returns. And you can actually realize that is real money in your pocket when you file your taxes. So I would say as a, as a um, real estate investor, I think that's probably one of the best provisions of the CARES Act as opposed to the PPP, which has gotten all the press. Absolutely. Thank you, Kirby. Good input there. Um, so we do have a question from one of our members um, who said, are there definitely funds still available? And because we don't know too much about this second round yet, they haven't really put out much about uh, what's available. Um, Ryan, can you, can you speak to that a little bit? And also, you know, kind of the backlogs, right, from the previous round, how that affects this round? Yeah, that's a, a great question and a, and a very good point. So the way this happened is uh, with the first launch, uh, the the SBA and the Treasury came out with guidance the night before it was supposed to go live. So a lot of banks were scrambling to get their application forms ready, and they were going through their legal departments, compliance departments, everything else, making sure they had everything ready on their end before they opened the doors. And that created a lot of confusion, uh, not only among the banks, but among the people who were applying. Many banks closed their doors to all non-customers. Uh, some banks even put further requirements, such as you had to have um, loans with them and a bank account and other criteria. Um, all of this is important to set up to understand why there were so many backlogs and so many issues. When the process, uh, or when the funds ran out, there were still hundreds, if not thousands, I would say tens of thousands of applications still in the queue. And most of the people that I talked to uh, all said, hey, our, our bank said, you know, they're out of money. They will process our application as far as they can until, you know, up to the point of submitting because they were all expecting there to be additional funds added. The additional funds were added, but in that time, there were tens of thousands of loan applications that had been processed. So as soon as the Small Business Administration opened the doors, all of those applications hit at once. So yes, there are still funds and uh, you should apply. Most of the people that I've talked to um, have had better luck going with a community bank or a local bank, like Kirby was talking about having the um, relationship with a, a local bank. 
they're having a lot more success with that than they were with some of the major banks. Um, it, it's not to say you can't go with a major bank. I do, I do know several folks who have had success with that as well. Um, I just think some of the larger banks waited too long to open their doors or they were focusing on some of their larger customers. Um, but yeah, the short answer is the, the Small Business Administration and the Treasury do expect this to be oversubscribed again. They do expect funds to run out. They don't know when. They don't know how much more need there will be, but there are still funds available. So that means apply today. Find a bank online if you can. Well, it's, it's all online, but find a bank that's accepting applications, whether it's for current customers or non-customers, and apply. And if you need time gathering your documentation, look, carve out a couple hours and do this. If your business is hurting, don't, don't wait. Don't think, well, I'll apply next month because we don't know if the, how long these funds are going to last. They're here today. If you need it, take it and then worry about the details later as far as paying it back and forgiveness and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And if I could add on to that too, I think that's, that's great information. They, they, um, one thing that they did add to this second round is that there's a carve out of 60 billion for smaller banks. So 30 billion of that is for banks with 50 billion in assets or lower. And then 30 billion is for banks with 10 billion in assets or lower. So basically they're, they're making sure this time that it's more of a, a fair playing field so that smaller companies that, that that bank at these smaller institutions can, can, you know, get their applications in as well. And they even shut down Wednesday night, they shut down the system for six hours to any bank above 1 billion in assets. So that's like super small banks had the opportunity then just to submit their applications during that window. So, so people weren't totally blocked out. Um, so, and then the treasury as of yesterday announced that they, they've lent out 90 billion total of the 310 billion in the second round. So it's about 39% as of yesterday has been lent out. So there's plenty more there. Um, you know, if, if it went at the same rate, it would probably be through next week uh, or the week after is when it would be exhausted. Absolutely. Yeah. And Kirby, thanks um, for those details, um, because I think that that is important to know where we are kind of sitting, um, you know, with the information that's out there um, for money that's available. I have another um, real estate uh, question. What resources are out there for property owners who have tenants that default during this time? Um, Kirby, I guess I'll send that to you first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think as most people saw on the news that they have pretty much stopped uh, evictions everywhere right now. So um, uh, there's that obviously increases tenants default rate because I think a lot of them take that as not needing to pay the rent anymore. Um, that's not the case that they're not forgiving rent. Um, they're just saying that, that somebody can't be evicted right now because of all the um, economic issues that are going on. So I think the best way to handle that, the way I, I've handled it and a lot of the people in, uh, that I know in that community is to approach the tenants proactively, make sure they understand all these benefits that are out there. There's, um, you know, obviously everyone got the stimulus check. They're talking about another stimulus check, um, but there's there's massive um, uh, there's a massive increase in unemployment. So there's never been federal unemployment. It's always been state before, and so now on top of the state unemployment that that a tenant who lost their job and can't pay rent would qualify for is an additional. Uh, check from the the government from the federal government, which I believe is six hundred a week. So um, that's an, another twenty four hundred dollars a month that somebody could be getting on unemployment in addition to their state unemployment. So there should be, you know, if if it's due to a loss of job that they can't pay their rent, if they if they understand some of these benefits that exist right now, um, and you know unemployment offices might be backed up and it might take some time, but there, uh, there should be enough assistance out there that it can help in a lot of those situations. Long-term, I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, you know, this, this real estate, it works its way through a lot slower than uh, a job loss, obviously, but, um, but in the near term, I, I would make sure all my tenants understand that. And then you can always work with them and, and maybe forgive a month, right now if they extend their lease and they, it's added on to the back or something like that, or, or they pay a little bit over time, um, there's, you know, you can get creative with it. 
absolutely. Um, and one of the things, you know, with, with the timeline, and as we look at the economic effects of this, um, you know, Ryan, to you is that um, a lot of people are saying, well, eight weeks that they have to utilize, um, you know, the money that they would get from the relief. But what if they're still struggling? What happens after that eight week timeline? Um, you know, and, and definitely, I don't think anybody is saying this is a 100% solution, um, but it is relief. It is, you know, helping in some way. So Ryan, could you speak to that a little bit, you know, for those that are kind of planning on still struggling after that eight weeks that this would uh, be in place? Yeah, so that's, that's a huge unknown. Um, this program was designed as a lifeline for businesses to keep them, uh, as Kirby mentioned earlier, it's designed to keep people employed so that they're not going on unemployment. Um, this, this is one of the tricky things because in some cases, you know, Kirby was just talking about the unemployment benefits where you can get that additional $600 a week from the federal in addition to what you get in the state. Uh, side. So some people are actually earning more money on unemployment than they were while working. And, you know, you can think of people who are generally a little lower on the wage scale. And if they're making more than, than they were when they were working, some businesses are actually going to have a hard time getting those employees back. So uh, it's, it's going to be difficult for some companies to actually use these funds as intended to pay payroll because some people don't want to return to work. Uh, after a while, those uh, people are going to run out of unemployment benefits and they're going to be searching for work again. So that's, that's one weird quirk of these two um, programs working together. Um, but after those eight weeks, what happens? Um, it's a great question. It's a huge unknown. This was designed to bridge a gap, a two month gap. And it was designed because they knew that for the next two months, you know, from the time that they passed this, there was going to be a lot of social distancing. A lot of businesses were going to be shut down. They don't know what those the after that two months is going to look like, um, but the government was hoping you know by then we'll have more clarity, uh, more states will be opening up, people will be getting back to normal. So that's the hope. Will it be 100% normal for every business? Absolutely not. Uh, that's when you're going to have to look into the economic um, impact disaster loans, and that's going to be a low interest loan. It's not forgivable but that might help you bridge that gap. It is very low interest. You can get larger amounts. And, you know, if that's something that, that can help you, then look into that. Look into other creative ways to cut expenses, generate more revenue, look into other grants, other loans. Um, each, each situation is going to be unique. So you're really going to have to sit down with your advisory board or your co-founders or whoever you have, uh, mentor, uh, mastermind group. I know our, our businesses are all different sizes, but find some kind of a trusted person or group or somebody who can help guide you through this situation um, and, and just look and see what other kinds of programs are out there. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I would encourage all of you as well to, to look at the um, first iteration of this conversation that we had as well, where we talked um, some about strategies um, for putting things in place, um, which is also kind of related to our, to our question from the audience, which is um, not that this is PPP or EIDL. What is the latest if you have not gotten the stimulus um, and reapplying for the stimulus package? Um, and I would add to this also, you know, what are some, and, and this probably is opinion or, you know, or things that you've heard, but what are some other options for entrepreneurs and small business owners right now that they could turn to besides the stimulus uh, package? Uh, Ryan, if you want to go first, that's fine. Yeah. So are you referring to the actual stimulus checks that were sent out? Well, I think so. I think they're, yes, I think that they're talking about the stimulus checks. Yeah, so uh, the stimulus checks were set up in a way that uh, people under a certain income level would receive that uh, stimulus check. People above a certain income level wouldn't receive it at all, right? So if you are eligible, it's based on your 2018 or 2019 tax return, whichever is the most recent one you filed, the IRS will automatically send you the stimulus check. They've done a pretty good job of that. No system is perfect. Um, they've already sent out close to 90 million of them. They sent the majority via direct deposit. Those were sent out uh, however you opted to receive a tax refund if you had one. So if you had a bank account listed on your tax return for a, a tax refund, they would automatically send it there. Uh, if not, they'll send a check, a physical one, to the last address they have on file. Now, 
the check, if you haven't received it yet and you're going to get a physical check, you could get it next week or it might be until September. And, and I'm not trying to be alarmist. The IRS can process 5 million checks a week. And there were, I think, over 70 million checks that they need to cut. They're starting with those who are lower on the income scale based on their adjusted gross income when they filed their taxes, and they're going up to the higher ones. So if you had higher income, you're going to wait a little longer. If you're on lower income, uh, you should receive it hopefully a lot sooner. But in terms of when exactly you'll receive it, the IRS has given some rough guidelines, but they're very rough. They have it basically broken down into $10,000 increments. So if you made zero to $10,000, you should have been in that first wave and then 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 and so on. But it's not an even distribution. So, you know, the, the zero to 10,000 might uh, be very small compared to the 40 to 50,000 range. And the 40 to 50,000 range might take, you know, it's, that's pretty close to the median. I think the median's in the 30 to 40 range. So those might actually take two or three weeks to send out because of the sheer number of individuals who have an adjust, adjusted gross income in that level. Uh, the IRS does have a website that you can check the status of your check. Uh, and you can also change uh, additional information on there, such as a direct deposit, or you can update your um, individual, your mailing address and that kind of thing. So uh, that's, that's the big information. Did that answer it or did you have something different in mind there? Yes, they said yes, that answered okay. it. Um, but, and you know, lastly, as we're coming up on time, I, I wanna actually flip that to um, PPP or EIDL. So a lot of the feedback that we're getting is just like no response or, you know, uh, no information essentially. Um, so what would you, um, you know, tell entrepreneurs or small business owners that are kind of waiting to hear back um, and maybe they're even waiting to hear from that first wave um, and then into the second wave, what should they be doing and should they try applying at another bank potentially? Ryan, go ahead. Or yep. Okay. Uh, so when I applied, my, my bank had a tracker, a status update. It had like five or six bars. It said, you know, application submitted, we're reviewing it, uh, it's submitted. They have a, the bank approved it. They submitted it to the SBA. SBA approved documents are being drawn up documents sent for um, signature. And then once I sign it, you know, every step of the way, it just moves further. And then it says uh, awaiting funding. And so you can track it that way. My, that's what my bank had. I imagine most banks have something similar. Many ba all banks are running this completely online. They're, they're not doing this um, in person, at least every bank that I've heard of. Uh, maybe some of the smaller banks are, I'm not positive on that. Uh, but most banks, they, the individual tellers, if you call your local bank, you know, if you go with the Chase Bank or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, Citibank, some of these major uh, firms that are processing tens of thousands of loans, they're not going to be able to check the status for you. So they'll have that automated uh, checker. But most banks that I've heard, they're saying, please don't call. We can't give you a status update. So you're flying a little bit blind until you get that information. Once you do get that approval, uh, that notice saying you were approved, they have 10 days to fund it. Then that's written into the law. So that has to happen. So if you're waiting from that first round, we're coming up really close to that 10 day period. So you, you're probably not going to get, um, approved now. If you haven't heard anything now, it's probably not going to happen from that first round. Um, so yes, you can go apply somewhere else. Um, the application form does, there's a checkbox that you have to click that says, I will not or have not applied anywhere else. I've talked to people who ended up applying like three or four places before they got one approved. That's because their application was so far back in the queue. So you're going to have to use your own judgment on whether to do that or not. But if you went through a bank and they're backed up, or you haven't heard anything, maybe you do try applying somewhere else. Um, again, that's going to be your own judgment call. Uh, a lot of banks just stopped processing. So if you can't get in touch with the bank where you initially applied, you have no further insight or information, go ahead and apply somewhere else. I would. Uh, but just make sure you don't accept funds for more than one loan. You probably won't get approved for more than one. But if by, you know, for some reason that happens, I, I wouldn't chance that because it specifically states you will not uh, you do that. So you don't want to end up uh, getting in trouble with the Small Business Administration, the Treasury, the IRS, any of that stuff. So that's, that's how I would approach it personally. 
Yeah. And, and also, you know, to an earlier point of it's not a perfect system. So, you know, if, if you do get approved twice, um, you know, just kind of turning that back um, for another small business to benefit from that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so as we uh, end, I will just go uh, first to Kirby for last words. And then uh, Ryan will give you a chance to, for some last words as well. Uh, okay, great. So there, there's two things that I want to mention. Um, one thing, just to caveat on what Ryan just said, uh, I did look back at the email from a, a friend who recently was approved right away through Oklahoma State Bank. That was the bank that they went through. They don't live in Oklahoma, but they reached out because they heard that they were doing these, these loans and they were looking for, you know, um, new accounts. And, and so they said that the process was seamless. They talked to somebody on the phone, they got the fun, funding right away. So if you're having that issue where it's just stalled out at a big bank, there's one option. You can go to the SBA website and they, they share all the different SBA lenders. And so you can look for other small banks where you can have that face-to-face -face communication. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to mention, since this was just released yesterday by the IRS, um, is there's a, there's a clarification around the taxes relating to the PPP. And it's something that you should know if you're taking the PPP. It says in the PPP or, or in the, um, uh, the, the CARES Act that this will not be taxed once it's forgiven. So you can take the funds, you pay, use them for a payroll, and they're forgiven. Um, and that, that is true, but the IRS clarified yesterday that they will not allow the PPP funds to be deducted um, as an expense. Any part of it that's used for uh, an expense that is forgiven. So they said this eliminates the double uh, tax benefit that, that they perceived you would get because, you know, what people thought before is they're basically getting free money. And so they're not being taxed for the discharge of the debt like you typically would if you had debt discharge. And then on top of that, the expenses that they're paying for would be deducted as expenses on their, their taxes. But the IRS is saying that's not the case. Um, so just so you know, um, that's, you know, that changes your, uh, your taxes could be pretty significantly depending on the size of the, the loan that you get. So it's something to ask your accountant about. Absolutely. Um, and Ryan, any, any last words for our entrepreneurs or small business owners? Yeah, uh, what, what Kirby just brought up is huge. Um, and uh, you did a great job on that, Kirby. And, you know, to that effect, it's, it's really not a huge deal to not have that deductible as an expense, because if it's coming in and it's not, a, um, it's, it's basically non-taxable income that you're turning around and, and moving right through your door. So it's just kind of flows through. It's in the end of the day, it's not going to make any huge difference uh, other than keeping your, your employees. Um, your, like he said, work with a tax professional. The other thing, um, as far as payroll costs that are excluded, uh, there's further clarification on that as well. Uh, Kirby uploaded uh, frequently asked questions and number seven had um, some information on there for any employee whose income exceeds $100,000, that's where it's capped. Um, but it's not any compensation about it. That's just for the salary. So there are other things that even if they're making 100,000 salary, uh, I'm gonna just read real fast. Um, so non-cash benefits, such as employer contributions to defined benefit or retirement plans, payment for healthcare, or uh, other insurance premiums and state and local taxes. So even if you have employees who are earning more than $100,000, uh, you can write off or, or apply those other expenses toward uh, forgiveness. So that's actually a huge benefit that um, was not, not clear at all in the initial iteration. So as with all of this, especially with the forgiveness, work with your payroll processing company, work with your tax professional, and then uh, from what I understand, the payroll forgiveness, you're gonna have to submit this to the bank. So you may have to work with the bank um, because the SBA doesn't have the manpower to uh, review every single loan. So basically they're gonna go to the bank and say, how did they do? Bank's gonna say this percentage was used for all the right stuff. And then whatever's not will convert into a non-forgivable non -forgivable portion of the loan. So just work with your, your, all your professionals and, uh, you know, there are still things that are going to be unknown. It's going to take a little bit of work, but hopefully uh, the, the cost benefit will far outweigh the, uh, the amount of work that you're having to put into this. 
Absolutely. Well, Ryan Kirby, thank you so much um, for you know this information for sharing with our community. Um, thank you to all of our attendees on Zoom and Facebook. Um, we have a lot of chatter going around. If you have other questions, we encourage you to post them um, in the Facebook group in our online community, um, or you can also email them to townhall at bunkerlabs.org um, if you would like, and we will try to get answers to those questions as soon as possible. Um, thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Take care.